you. Uh, thanks so much, Veer, for taking time out. And, uh, you know, I can see a few people have already joined in. And I guess more people will start uh, coming in. And I know that uh, any attempt to introduce you out here would be rather silly because practically everyone who has long been here knows who you are. You know. Charles, can you be a little louder? Just closer to the air. Slightly inaudible. Oh, okay. My apologies for that. I was just saying that, you know, it, you know, any attempt to kind of introduce Veer out here to this room would be rather silly because everybody who is logged in here uh, knows who you are, you know, uh, writer, editor, television personality, food writer. And um, I completed uh, your, your most recent book, uh, A Rude Life, uh, is an absolute blast. And, uh, Thank you. And uh, just uh, before we logged in, in fact, we were just uh, talking about Ram was uh, sharing with me uh, how much he enjoyed uh, your earlier books. And to those of you uh, who have logged in, uh, if you haven't read A Rude Life yet, read it. And the reason I'm saying that is because, uh, you know, I'm not the kind of guy who laughs loudly when reading a book uh, or for that matter, mutters something in the head and says that, you know, this man is making this up. But I have actually done that when reading this book. And my wife and daughter, older daughter, they actually thought that something is the matter with me. <laughs> uh, I, I'm not making that up. I really mean that. Uh, and that's what happened. Uh, but uh, uh, but as I was going through it, you know, this was one of those rare memoirs. You know, this it was not a pretentious one. You know, and I could I could see a couple of arcs out there, and that's what I want to you know start out with. You know, there was okay. a personal arc. Uh, there's an India arc, uh, and uh, there is uh, uh, and and these arcs attempt to tell the media narrative and captures the India story as you have seen it. And uh, there are a whole truckload of questions uh, that are playing at the back of my mind. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll, we'll, we'll keep all of this interactive. So to those of you who have logged in, uh, please raise your hands or punch in the questions if you may not want to come on stage, whatever. My colleagues, Anmol, Ram, Sweta, they're out here. You know, they'll either get you up on stage or we can see the questions as you punch it in, whatever you feel comfortable. So let's just get going with this, Veer. You know, first thing that comes to mind, Veer, is as I was reading this book, uh, is that, and I read an earlier interview with you. Just how did you write a book in three months? It's uh, not I, that difficult. It's not that difficult. I'll tell you how. Because I was stuck at home. telling me it's not difficult. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you how I did it. Wait, 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 one second. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I have to butt in. You've been very yeah. rude to a lot of people in there. So I'm going, to, I'm going to make an attempt to be, I'm taking a brief from your page. Just how the hell do you write as smoothly as you do when you do that? You know, and how do you write the kind of things that appear as blasphemous as it does? I would shudder to put it in print anyway, you know. I'm not sure about the blasphemy part, but the writing is easy. I was stuck at home. It was the lockdown. I had damn all to do. So I said to myself, I'll write one chapter a day. And one chapter a day means, what, 2,000 words a day? Which, I mean, my column used to be 1,800 words. is now down to 12, 14. But I'm quite used to writing about 2,000 words a day. So I did that on the days when the words were coming. I was really into it. I sometimes did two chapters. Days when I felt I really didn't want to go back into my past. And I, I just gave it a miss. So there are, what, 61 chapters? So I needed 61 days to write it. So three months, about 90 days. So given that I didn't necessarily write every day, it was quite easy to do it in 90 days. It's The trick is to see it not as a book, but to see it as a collection of chapters. Then it's less intimidating. Every time I've tried to write a book, I found I don't have the stamina to do it. I find the idea very intimidating. But this was an easy way of doing it. And on the blasphemous part, uh, Veer, I mean, how did you just get around that? There are a lot of things, you know, that... Blasphemous? That no, yeah. what, what's blasphemous? Oh, Veer, like, what? Uh, like what? Okay, let me okay, let me just pluck out one example, you know, straight out of the air. You know, we put, yeah. uh, you know, uh, you know the, the, that particular one episode that comes to mind, for instance, you know, uh, where you speak about uh, running into Pramod Mahajan at the restroom, for instance, yeah. right? And the both, but the both of you uh, land up at the uh, ladies' uh, or, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Restroom, right? room. yeah, yeah, there's only a ladies' room. Yeah, yeah, there's only a ladies' room, right? And then you know, 
you're stumped and uh, you know uh, you kind of uh, look at him and he looks at you and it, I'm, i'm just paraphrasing it because i don't have the exact words right and he says so what i'm a ladies man or something to that extent right no anyway, actually what like, he said was much worse i've cleaned it up in the book he <laughs> said ye bhi ladies ke liye ladies only ke liye hai and then went into uh, so right. it was actually, so i've cleaned it up slightly in the book but i mean it was easy enough because it actually happened i remembered the incident and afterwards when i reminded him that he had said it he told me that he was actually quoting a marathi author <coughs> called acharya atre who had first made this joke and it was clearly a joke he made quite often when clearly he'd made a habit of going to ladies toilets <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. Okay, I'll I'll come back to that. I'll come back okay. to that. Okay. You know. I'll come back to that a uh, little later. But you know, if I were to cut back, you know, like I said, to your personal narrative, you know, uh, yeah. just going back uh, to your younger years, you know, from where yeah. you started out from, um, you know, on a very serious note, uh, you speak about starting out uh, your education at Oxford, and uh, you make the point there that. uh the some there's a very interesting observation there you make that that's the place where it taught you how to think and uh, that uh, you oh, that that's where you learned how to cut the crap and come to the point yeah. you know but you left it at that you know and i i i i wish you had done a bit of a deep dive there and i had to do a bit of reading between the lines uh through your anecdotes on how did you think for yourself through the course of your career no can you can you take us through how exactly did you have you cut through the crap so uh, really and i come at this because we are living with information overload we live in such kind of times you know so can you give us some specific examples of what is it that you choose to take in and what is it that you choose to ignore Yeah actually I think it was more a guide to how I write rather than a guide to how I live my I live my life which no doubt is full of lots of crap but I'll tell you what it was about the Oxford system I didn't write a lot about Oxford because frankly I am bored of old fogies telling me how they went to Oxford and they went on the punts and they had wonderful english friends as the greatest university in the world etc etc I was very clear it wasn't going to be one of those snobbish I had such a wonderful time drinking champagne at Oxford memoirs so but I have to acknowledge that the Oxford system helped me in those days I haven't been back now so I don't know what the system is in those days you didn't get in on the basis of your A level results usually you had to take an entrance exam after the entrance exam you were interviewed they were looking they said not just for people with good results but people with potential that was what the system was supposed to unearth so as exam results of course only unearth what you've actually achieved once you got there you could go to lectures but those were optional the system worked on the basis of tutorials you went in to see a tutor usually young always informal you called him by his first name he called you by your first name he would if the tutorial was at a reasonable time produce some sherry or maybe a little whiskey so you could both drink it sometimes they'd produce the whiskey even if it wasn't a reasonable time and what he would do is he would ask you to write an essay on a subject say let's give me let me take an example the way in which nixon lost the presidency shows you that the american system is corrupt or something like that you had to go away and read six books seven books read whatever you wanted about it you had to come back and write a an essay commenting on that you could agree with the proposition you could disagree with the proposition but you had to read it aloud and after you would finish reading it he would take your essay apart he would say you say this but that contradicts what you said earlier how would you respond to this so the whole process was academically and intellectually very grueling because he made you challenge every assumption and defend it so what it turned I mean, that's the entire oxford system basically just people writing essays and people tearing them apart so by the end you could anticipate what objections there would be and your essays got better but essentially what the oxford system teaches you is how to order your ideas that all of us in our minds we have a lot of information as you correctly said and there's often a lot of confusion you know a bit of this you know a bit of that what oxford taught me was just to get to the kernel of an issue 
and to write it in a way that expressed just that. It's helped me, I think, throughout my career in how I write articles or even books. People say that writing well is about good English and all of that. I think that's crap. I don't think writing well is really about the English. Writing well is about how you organize your thoughts. If your mind is well organized, if your ideas are well organized, if one thing flows from the other, if there is an argument through the piece, then I think the article or the column works. And th that, I think, Oxford taught me. Right. <clears throat> so, so it's very interesting you say that. And even as you answered, you know, even as you were talking about that, you spoke about, uh, you know, uh, uh, about how you graduated from there and you took a call to move back to India and mm -hmm. uh, your assignment at Imprint Magazine. And, Bombay. It was Bombay uh, Magazine. When I came back, Bombay, Bombay Magazine. I'm sorry, and then then you went on, and um, uh, later on there was imprint that happened, right? Uh, right. That's that correct. A, the, the chronology. Now, uh, uh, you know, I was talking about those jaw dropping moments, and actually, you know, this is when I said, uh, you know, uh, this was at the peak of the Cold War, uh, so to speak, between the U.S. and the U.S.S.R. And uh, when you discovered that the magazine was actually a covert CIA operation to counter Russian propaganda. Now, I had no clue where you were going to, you know, going to until you dropped that bombshell. Now, on the one hand, it was a fantastic story that you were telling. There was, there was a masterclass in great writing on the one hand about what a fantastic team you had, uh, how you had built it up, and then suddenly you dropped this bombshell. And then I said, oh, shit, at that moment. Uh, well, to my, be fair. My, I, I actually said be, that. Well, I have to stop you because to be fair, what I discovered was that the magazine was set up by the CIA. It was set up by a pair of Americans called Gloria and Arthur Hale. I have no idea whether, whether these were cover identities or whether this was the re this was the real name. And it had been set up by the CIA to carry excerpts of American bestsellers because during the Cold Cold War era, they feared, I mean, idiots, it wouldn't have happened, but they feared that Russian propaganda and Russian folk tales would sway Indians. Therefore, they thought we needed a dose of low, a low price dose of American popular culture, which is why they started Imprint. I had to be persuaded when I discovered this, that the people I worked for were still not with the CIA. And so as, as I say over there, we did a lot of digging and discovered at some stage when the operation ended, the CIA disposed of the magazine and sold it to the biddlers, who sold it to the people I worked for. So fortunately, I didn't work for the CIA even covertly. But it is a bit frightening to realize that the publication you worked for was actually founded by the CIA. Yeah. So, you know, even as my... You know, I, what I was getting to was that, you know, you were very young when that assignment happened, really. And uh, at, that, at that age, you know, if something like that would have happened to me, I would probably have never trusted anyone after that. What did that do to you, really? How did, what, uh, how, what was the impression that left you with? Well, I think initially when I heard that it was founded by the CIA, I went white as a sheet. And I was very frightened, which is when I started doing some digging around, asking to see the documents, the letters of sale, etc. So I don't know whether it was because I was, I was what, 26? I, I joined Imprint in 1982. Yeah, so I was 26. So whether it had happened to me then, and I discovered this a little later, but if I had been older, I think I would just been as shocked. The point is that there are many mysteries in the world which are not really open to you. You don't really understand them till you dig deep or somebody drops a hint. And then you realize that the world is a much more complicated place than we realize. And certainly than we realized when we were young. Right. Guys, for those of you who have logged in a little late, we're in conversation with Veer Sangwi. So if you have questions, uh, you know, this is an interactive session. So please do raise your hand or post your comments, whatever it may be. Uh, my colleagues Anmol and Ram are, uh, you know, watching and they'll pull you up on stage and, you know, we can, you can, you know, uh, you can just uh, 
feel free to ask Veer whatever you may want to uh, ask him. This is a free-flowing, interactive conversation, right? Uh, and right now we're, uh, you know, at that part with uh, we're discussing the early stages of his uh, career, and we'll move on. We'll just move on to the, uh, you know, uh, as he sees contemporary India uh, and uh, how his career has transitioned. Uh, so, uh, we, um, you know, uh, I just want to move on to the, the, the next part. You know, you have spoken about um, uh, your life um, as you shifted gears uh, long after that. Uh, and uh, there is this uh, very, very interesting anecdote uh, where, you, where you speak about, uh, I'm paraphrasing this year. Uh, the coming of age, so to speak, of the Indian magazines uh, with Arun Puri leading the pack and you were in the thick of action out there. And uh, this particular anecdote stood out uh, for me, the cover story on Sham Benegal, for instance, uh, mm. that you described in much detail. Uh, and uh, uh, it was an interesting one that stood out with uh, for me because uh, the cover story line was is sham a sham and in your words that wasn't what the story was all about but it helped the cause and the magazine sold out now if i asserted for a moment that this was a precursor to clickbait headlines absolutely With the benefit of head hindsight how would you take to that no, you're absolutely right. It was clickbait. I mean, we think that clickbait is something that millennials invented with the internet. Not. We've always been told, especially when we're in the magazine business, that the cover of a magazine is not just a representation of the contents of the magazine. It is also a marketing tool. The idea is to get somebody to pick up the magazine and therefore increase the sales of the magazine. Now, it's a little more complicated than that because India Today, which was the magazine in question, was patterned on Time and Newsweek. We're talking about the 1970s. In the 70s, Time was a really big deal in America. But something like 80% to 90% of Time sales in the United States were through subscription. Newsstand sales were a very small amount of their total sale. Therefore, Time in America could afford to be very responsible what it put on the cover. Not true in India. In India, we depended solely on newsstand sales. There were very few subscribers. And therefore, there was an incentive to do these clickbait type covers to do things that made people pick up the magazine. In contrast, newspapers worked on a subscription model in that you rarely went out in the morning and bought your newspaper. You got the newspaper delivered to your home in the morning and maybe if it was very boring you discontinued it but usually that was too much effort so you let it come so newspapers therefore were much more responsible but magazines because they depended on newsstand sales sales were traditionally a little clickbaity right uh, and as a follow-up to that one you know we now live in a time where the smartest line uh, on social media attracts the most number of views and they are the most uh, and they are the new influencers as opposed to people such as uh, Arun Puri uh, who set the narrative back then. Um, would that be a fair thing to say? Uh, do you reckon that the current breed of publishers are doing enough to stay in the game? How would you, what would your assessment be? I have a question always about the term influencer we use the term influencer in the contact on the in the context of social media to refer to somebody who has an opinion which he or she puts across on twitter or facebook or wherever yeah but are they actually influencing things when you see these headlines which seem like clickbait you read them and you discover the story is nonsense are you really influenced by them I'm not convinced you are. I think we use the word influencer too loosely. I think things that influence you are still things that are less sensational, less clickbaity, things that are slightly more substantial. So how do you get people influenced? Now, unfortunately, in our times, we have found that the best way to do this is to make up stories. 
which is why so much of the information available today on social media, say WhatsApp forwards, is lies. It's just stuff that people have made up and put on, usually not necessarily to get views, but to serve some political agenda or some other kind of agenda. People have also discovered on social media that a narrative of victimhood and hatred go does well. So what you need to do to be successful in social media, particularly if you have a political agenda, is to say to somebody, you are so badly off and these, I'll use the word beginning with B, have done it all so successfully. You see that pretty much every day in Indian politics. If you look at Yogi Atitinath's famous statement made what, a couple of weeks ago, when he said the rations earlier used to be colored by, and he used an elaborate expression having to do with Abhajan and all that, colored essentially by Muslims. That kind of thing worked because it was the classic social media kind of thing. Hindus were the victims of politicians who wanted to favor Muslims, and Muslims were the bad guys because they took away their grain, they took away their rations. If you look at social media narratives now, there is so much of this bogus victimhood and so much of hatred spread basically on the basis of false information. What Yogi Adityanath said was inaccurate. It was easy to prove that he was wrong. But the problem with social media is that nobody calls out this bullshit. You get away with this kind of nonsense. You get away with these kind of lies. When you come talk about mainstream media for all its faults and I'll be the first to admit there are lots and lots of faults. There's also a vetting process. There's also an editing process. Yogi Adityanath's statement, most newspapers pointed out, was not accurate. But social media treated it as though it was the gospel truth. So the danger to social media comes not really from clickbait, because we are now smart enough to know what clickbait is and what sensation is. It comes from lies. It comes from hatred. It comes from bogus victimhood. Right. Very interesting. Uh, but stay with me on that view. That mm -hmm. is on the social. That is that is on the uh, on the societal part. Now I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm 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 staying with you on your career transitions. You have witnessed two significant transitions, at least two significant transitions in your career. The coming of age of Indian print media as a very young man. You were. Um, you witnessed the coming of age of television in India and you dived into both of it even as it was emerging and we are now at an inflection point where the media is transitioning into digital and business models are very, very fuzzy at this. So on the one hand, there is a, there is a social narrative that is playing out and then on the other hand, we also have a business that doesn't that, that does not know what to do with itself. You know, it's, it's very, very fuzzy. What, now you've been an editor, you've been at the helm, and you had to deal with multiple sets of complexities. What do you see on the horizon? What are you tinkering around with that we don't know about? Would you want to share some thoughts around that? Yeah, I have to tell you very honestly that I went for the oldest medium of them all. I wrote a book. But a surprisingly large number of people have consumed the book on Kindle. I do most of my reading now on Kindle. So technology in many ways assists what media was always doing, whether it was newspapers, whether it was books, or whether it was television, which is more and more consumed on devices rather than on television sets. So I think that's okay, and I'm part of that. What worries me is that most countries have been able to make the transition from mainstream and conventional media to digital media quite easily. If you look at, say, the United States and take the New York Times or the failing New York Times, as Donald Trump used to call it, it's no longer the failing New York Times. They declared a huge profit last year and they did it on the basis of their internet site because it's a pay site, people pay subscriptions and people come and read the New York Times. I read the New York Times every day having paid a subscription, even though I am in Delhi miles away from them. I could never have seen the New York Times in the old days because I didn't have access to the print edition. Now, that is how media has transitioned. The problem in India is that newspapers didn't really charge us a lot. Since the 1980s, the Times of India set that trend. Newspapers began to be given away or sold very cheaply. 
the idea was to get huge, huge numbers of circulation. And once you had the circulation, you went to advertisers and you said, I can deliver so many readers to you. So the whole economics of the newspaper model changed to serving the advertiser rather than the reader. Now, obviously, there are many things wrong with that. But what it also led to was a situation where Indians came to believe that news is free. Think about it. You watch television channels. You pay what? Peanuts to your cable operator, assuming you have a package that involves news. You pay peanuts even to Tata Sky, assuming you have that package. You get newspapers for what? absolute peanuts if you're paying for them at all. Then to go on the web, go and pay for a website, to pay for a digital subscription to newspaper, that is something Indians do not seem willing to do. And that is basically the problem. That's why business models of digital media in India are, as you say, fuzzy. How will you make money creating news, finding out news, editing news for people who are used to not paying for news? So I think that's the dilemma all of us face. Newspapers are in decline, as we know. We know that all newspapers have cut budgets, that staff have been retrenched or asked to go. We know that television channels now have a hand-to-mouth existence. Very few of them are making any money. So what will take the place of this uneconomical model now? Will it be free media, which is digital? If it's free media, media that's not run on any commercial basis, then it'll be media that is run to serve other ends, like political purposes. People will get their news from websites that are very dodgy, from WhatsApp forwards. So. As you say, we are at an inflection point, and it is quite crucial for the future of Indian media. Right. Um, and uh, uh, we, before I, you know, before I just shift gears uh, into, you know, the, the other narratives that you have to speak about India, um, I have one more question to ask of you on this specific theme, uh, 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 really, you know, uh, while you have spoken about the people who that you have, the, whom you have worked with, you know, whether it be Avik Sarkar, whether it be about um, uh, uh, the Bharati, as uh, you've spoken very highly about uh, uh, KK Birla and Shobna Bharati, uh, the one person whom you uh, have spoken about is Samir Jain. Um, hmm. And you spoke very highly about his business acumen and uh, the kind of changes that he brought in the, into the industry. And you spoke about his understanding and of about how he could look at the media business as a, as FMCG. Uh, would you punt on him? Would you bet on someone like him as someone who could recreate these kind of business models, the way he fundamentally altered structures uh, in well, the past? Yeah. Okay, it's interesting because what I spoke about, about the advertiser becoming king, is essentially a Times of India creation during Samir's time. Partly, as I said in the book, Samir realized what the potential of newspapers was and developed it. He had, as he said, with the Economic Times and the Times of India, undervalued brands, quote, unquote, and he extracted value from them. But he was also helped enormously by the 1991 reforms. The 1991 reforms, which made everything available in India, created a new class of Indian. People weren't just readers, they were consumers. And I think the Times of India understood that before anybody else. It also understood that advertisers had newer products to sell, products that were not available before. And it catered to those advertisers and turned itself with Bombay Times and Delhi Times and stuff like that, even the main paper, into a sort of glossy advertisement for the consumer society that was emerging. And all that was Samir's, to Samir's credit. And that's why the Times, which had always lost money under Samir and his brother Vineet, became such a profitable company and the unquestioned market leader. But as I said in the last answer, it's a strategy that has now run its course. Advertisers are moving away. We are in an age of digital media. Advertisers are not spending all their money on print. So if advertisers are not going to read newspapers, 
and sub newspaper readers and subscribers are not going to pay for your newspaper sites because you got them used to the idea that news is free. In the long run, you've actually cut your nose to spite your face. Right. Sure. Sure. <clears throat> Sorry. Sorry. So, um, we before I before we move into the political path, I think my colleague Anmol has a has a question to ask you, and you know the both of us were just discussing that. Uh, a little while ago, and you know, the both of us were scratching our heads, and we actually laughed out a bit loud. Anmol, you want to shoot that question of Veer? Yeah. So, I mean, Veer, wherever the biggest parties town in town is happening, you seem to be there. Uh, I mean, whether it's the CIA, whether it's the prime ministers, whether it's rock star musicians, uh, whether it's the underworld, whether it's you know Bollywood superstars. Um, or maybe it's just that wherever you are, the biggest party happens to start there. So just how do you do it? Like, what's the secret sauce? Yeah, I don't do it. What happens with a memoir is like it's a greatest hits album. You know, every band which releases 12 albums probably has 12 decent songs. And that becomes the greatest hit album. Large chunks of my life were very boring. All I've done is I've cherry picked the most interesting parts, which is why it seems I go from one exciting adventure to another. I honestly, real life was not like that. There's a lot of boring stuff that I didn't put into the book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But while you say that, Veer, I mean, there is a certain charisma about you which we normally don't associate with journalists. I'm sorry, Charles, but... <laughs> I, I, I object to that. I object to that. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. So, 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 so uh, there is uh, a certain sort of charisma. So uh, how did that come about? Was it innate? Or how do you look at it? Uh, what has it done for you? Where has it come from? If I knew what this charisma was, I would answer that question. But honestly, I've never really felt there was any particular charisma about me. I think I evoked a certain amount of interest because I was young, younger than most other editors. So people thought I was unusual. After that, I was one of the first editors to go into television. So I became a print journalist and editor whose face people saw and recognized. I think those two things made me seem rather more interesting than I was. And I think that's what you're calling charisma. But it was basically just accidents having to do with being in the right place at the right time. Right. Thanks. Thanks, mm -hmm. Veer. Anmol, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to take you up on that. We're going to discuss this separately, you know, about the charisma part. You know. <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyway, Veer, like I said, you know, I just want to shift gears a bit, you know, and, uh, you know, get into a uh, bit of politics about which you've had a ringside view from your early days. You know, so there is this part, you know, uh, from the early days, you know, where you start speaking about the early days of the Congress and the death of Sanjay Gandhi, for instance, and how most people in the Congress secretly rejoiced about it. And there's this part in there's this passage there that stayed with me where you describe your encounter with Murli Deora because you needed an obituary. And he asks you a question, Margara Sala, and you <laughs> respond in the affirmative and then he goes on to say in a solemn voice, Sri Sanjay Gandhi was a dynamic youth leader who leaves a void. It Twists, and then you go on to say it was pretty much the same thing with everyone is, uh, else I called. You know, no, uh, no, quite honestly, I have spent most of my career as a business writer, and but I could actually visualize the sheer brutality and the sheer coldness of it, even as you were describing that encounter. You know, that Margaya Sala kind of a thing. And you know, uh, question to you here is. Has anything changed in politics since the time you started looking, started uh, uh, writing about it, or has it even has it gotten even more brutal since then? No, actually, it just tends to repeat itself. If you look at the criticisms of Sanjay Gandhi, they were as follows: that he was dictatorial, that his worldview didn't appear to include Muslims as a equal minority in India, that he was perhaps not as secular as a leader should have been, that he was dismissive with underlings, that he was vindictive. Now, all of this may sound familiar, because it's pretty much the stuff his critics say about Narendra Modi. So, 
I mean, life goes on, the names change, but the traits remain the same. Right. So, you know, so moving on, you know, there is your description of Rajiv Gandhi, you know, for instance, you know, uh, as well, you know, mm. uh, uh, you, uh, you spoke about the, your first interaction with him when he was in power. And uh, the impression you convey there is that of a fundamentally decent man who knew his weaknesses and that sized up the ecosystem around him. Um, and then as the narrative moves along, there is this part where you speak about it was that it was not his genius, but the Hindu vote that had consolidated behind him and had actually catapulted him into power, but he was unaware about it and frittered that away. Mm. Now, uh, I, I found that quite interesting. Now, in the same way, there is a description of El Kiarwani uh, that describes him as a man who comes across as someone who is a very reasonable man in one-on-one -on -one interactions, but who cultivates a very, very different narrative in the public eye to capture power. Now, for most of us, you know, who are very removed, far removed from how politics operates and works, uh, how do we reconcile with such dichotomies uh, with people who occupy high office? How are we to read them for what they are and what does it take to understand them? You know, what have your learnings been out there? It's very difficult. It's very difficult to actually predict what a politician will do in the right circumstances. Many of us in Delhi, when Narendra Modi was the general secretary of the B BJP, he'd come from the RSS. We knew him. He was a happy person, a person who would laugh with people, completely approachable. He came to the studio to do my television shows, driving out to Noida. And he was really well liked. You contrast that with the sort of forbidding personality he now has, where he's not at all approachable. You could never have imagined that would happen. You take the case of Advani, which was your chosen example. Advani was really, in many ways, just a sidekick to Vajpayee. He used to write Vajpayee's speeches. He used to sort of worship the ground Vajpayee walked on. And yet, during that Rajiv Gandhi period, when Vajpayee lost his own seat to Madhav Rao Sindhya and was out in the cold, Advani saw the opportunity and grabbed it. He saw that there was a vacuum at the top of the BJP. He also saw that Hindus who had faith in Indira Gandhi and had hopes of Rajiv Gandhi now felt betrayed and bereft. And seizing that opportunity, he created this narrative of Hindu victimhood, which continues to this day. I mean, you have to have a certain genius to make 85% of the population who have all the best jobs, who control almost everything, the economy in the country, feel that they're hard done by. But Advani managed to do it by using the Babri Masjid as a symbol of injustice to Hindus. And he is not unusual in this. Most politicians ultimately are opportunists. When they see an opportunity, they grab it. And in grabbing it, if they have to twist and turn, if they have to change what they say they believed in, if they have to stab their old mentors in the back, they will happily do it. That's why they are in politics. Very interesting. Very interesting one, uh, that one. So, so here's a follow-up on that one, the point that you made out there. Uh, uh, you know, you also made the point that L.K. Advani actually cried when the masjid was demolished. Yes. Uh, what does that really say about him? Was he a uh, conflicted man? No, I, I mean, first of all, Advani cries at anything. If you, <laughs> went to, yeah, I mean, he has actually said this in interviews that he once read an article in that Bible of medical knowledge, the Reader's Digest, that was his chosen thing about people who have a problem which makes them cry very easily. And he said he identified with that because he found that he cried all the time. So the fact that Advani cried is not in itself that unusual because he cries a lot. What was more interesting to me was the reason why he cried. Again, according to Pramod Mahajan, the ladies' toilet man, he led uh, Advani away from the 
elevated platform where they were all sitting during the Ayodhya demolition as it turned out and took him to a guest house where they were staying. And throughout, Advani cried. And Advani kept saying, they have destroyed my movement. How will I talk about the Babri Masjid? Now there is no Babri Masjid. So he did not cry because he felt sorry at the desecration. He felt sorry at the vandalism. He cried for purely selfish reasons. <laughs> so, so while on that, while on that, there is also a hypothesis that you have presented on the pages uh, that in any which case the Babri Masjid was a contested structure and that it was in disuse in any which way, hmm. and that if if the Muslim uh, community had, uh, you know, like a, like a large section of Muslims had uh, uh, already suggested that, uh, you know, you just give it away. You know, what difference does it make? And uh, uh, latch on to Advani's offer that you will build a grand uh, masjid in place of that structure. Um, you know, the Hindutva agenda would perhaps uh, have been Still bomb. That's a hypothesis you just you had presented uh, out there, uh, but you had. I, I thought you just kind of left it out there. Uh, can you take us through your thinking on yeah, that? Sure. It was most sure. fascinating. Sure. I mean, I don't know how many people remember what the Babri Masjid was. The Babri Masjid was a mosque in Ayodhya, which had been the subject of dispute between Hindus and Muslims for a very long time. At the time when the Babri Masjid, the latest version of the Babri Masjid dispute broken broke out. No namaz had been said in that mosque for decades. It was more or less a disused structure. What Advani was claiming, and I think without any evidence or without any logic, was that this mosque had been built on the birthplace of Ram by Muslim invaders, which was not true because A, we don't know what the birthplace of Ram was, B, whether he was even a historical figure. So there were many question marks. But this was Advani's claim, and he managed to sell it quite successfully to Hindus. What Advani then said was that in Pakistan, mosques are moved all the time, say to facilitate the building of a road or whatever, and the technology exists to move buildings more or less stone by stone, brick by brick. So it's not difficult. Why don't the Muslims agree to shift it a few meters away, maybe 100, 200, 300 meters away? And if they don't want to shift just this existing mosque, if they want to build a very grand mosque, then he himself would go and help them build it. He followed this up by saying that for us, it's the holiest spot in Hinduism. Dodgy claim, but he said it anyhow. For Muslims, it means nothing. Why don't you agree? Now, frame that way, it's not an unreasonable demand. And I reckon if the Muslim community had said, yes, come and go and build us another mosque, we'll give it to you as the symbol of our sacrifice for our Hindu brethren, but we will not let you do this in Shomnath or Mathura or any other mosque, Advani would have had no choice but to accept it. They would have nipped all this Hindu anger in the bud. But the Babri, Mac um, uh, Babri Masjid Action Committee, I think it was called, the body that represented Muslim interests in this, was so, so stuck in its views, it refused to yield an inch. And because of its intransitions and because of its unwillingness to discuss any kind of compromise, I think it helped fuel the Hindu backlash. Now, the view of the Babri Masjid Action Committee and of many Muslim leaders during that time was that this was a one-off. Advani was trying this stunt and nothing would come of it. My view was that it was not a one-off, that there had been a Hindu backlash building up since 1984 or even earlier, that Rajiv Gandhi had been elected on the basis of that Hindu wave, that Advani was hijacking that wave. And to pretend that this was just a stunt and nothing would happen was a mistake. Because if you did not take it to the flood, if you did not stop the wave early enough, it would lead to a situation where the BJP would become India's principal party. Nobody agreed with me then, but I rest my case. I think you can see what's happened. Yes, indeed. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, you have the merit uh, in your argument. Um, so, while on that, uh, you know, while the uh, even as the ascendant of the BJP was happening, and when Vajpayee Prime Minister, uh, when Vajpayee uh, Prime Minister Vajpayee was in power, uh, there was this this is very very interesting anecdote uh, that you. Uh, uh, refer to uh, uh, that you recount, and I find I, I thought that particularly interesting. Uh, 
about uh, him finding himself in a bind uh, because he faces the situation uh, about uh, having to accede uh, whether he, whether indian troops uh, troops must be sent uh, to iraq uh, and after a request from the us and because adwani had tied himself into a bind uh, and you described that in much detail hmm. and uh, he reaches out to sonia gandhi and asks him asks her to raise objections on the floor of the parliament and they have this nice little backroom thing going on between them and she agrees uh to do that and india refuses to send the army to iraq um or for that matter there's this other incident where you describe that prime minister wajpay wants uh, pc alexander to be elevated as president uh, who was a gandhi family loyalist to become president but sonia gandhi puts her foot down and uh, abdul kalam gets the top job now the way i see it as a reader that uh, these are vignettes of an india where the ruling party and the opposition worked in tandem behind the scenes uh and played uh for uh for the benefit of the larger interest now you continue to have access to what happens behind the scenes does that continue to happen is or how do you reckon or, or will such narratives play out in the future are we missing something here it doesn't happen with this government it happened during the manmohan singh period when he did the indo us nuclear deal and it was opposed by the bjp he reached out to many people within the bjp who saw his point and ultimately moderated their opposition the deal was only objected to really by the left who thought it was a sell out to america or whatever but the bjp and the left was an ally but the bjp saw the point especially on matters of foreign policy india has always functioned on the basis of a political consensus because one prime minister will be replaced by another prime minister but russia america will not be replaced right nations don't have permanent friends or enemies or permanent prime ministers they only have permanent interests and those interests have to be the interests of india not the interests of a particular government until this government was elected that was pretty much the way things went on mr modi every opposition leader will tell you consults the opposition only sort of as a matter of form hardly anyone is taken into confidence hardly anyone's opinion is asked for i think almost every opposition leader would have told him that he shouldn't have gone and effectively campaigned for donald trump when donald trump was president they would have told him that you keep a certain distance from political leaders in other countries you represent india and they represent their country they're not your pals or people you want to you need to support but mr modi didn't listen and from mr modi's perspective the india in which the opposition and the government sat together and planned things in back rooms was a bad india it was an india ruled by elites he is a guy who has changed all this and therefore he will upend all those conventions so it's possible that if mr modi ever loses an election somebody else comes to power we will go back to those conventions but in mr modi's time i don't see it happening right uh ig i believe uh, you have some questions ig would you like to come in yeah thanks charles uh, hi veer uh, uh, congratulations on the book uh, i i must confess i haven't yet uh, started reading but uh, there was a friend of mine who uh he and i kind of exchanged a lot of your uh, hilarious anecdotes from the book especially about uh, a publisher we all love which is avik sarkar in calcutta because we've spent i spent almost 10 years of my career there with avp uh and i had a question on on the role of the publisher and the relationship between publishers and editors and how that's evolved from the time you started out in the 80s and through to where we are now we've just faced a horrendous situation where uh, the editor in chief of one of the largest uh, or um, one of the magazines outlook was asked to go by the by the publisher um, how would you kind of contrast the time when you kind of joined the profession that that relationship between publishers and editors and you worked with some of the finest right um, any thoughts any stories that yeah. you'd like to share I think it also has to do with the relationship between the media and the government. Right. I think in the 
talked about nobody in the government put pressure on proprietors and said sack your editor now i think that happens reasonably often at least much more often than it used to there's also another factor which is that proprietors in those days we talked about sabeej at length saw themselves as being in partnership with editors people who started newspapers didn't stop them to make money you could make much more money in another business they had some social purpose or the other in their minds so therefore the editor was not just an employee but was somebody they entrusted with a job that was slightly more noble than just running a factory or making ball bearings or whatever there was also a tradition that proprietors would respect editors because i mean a week ago i remember once asking about the many editors who ran riot and the many journalists he said look a journalist is different from an ordinary employee an editor can call the prime minister he can call the home minister he can call various people he is used to a certain level of access and being treated with respect by top people it doesn't work then if he comes into his office and he's treated as a lowly employee by his bosses you have to respect the level at which he operates now i think we are in a situation where first of all editors don't have that kind of access to prime ministers or whatever because this government doesn't particularly like journalists except for the tame ones and proprietors on the whole don't like the idea that editors have access to top politicians or top people they believe they should have that access themselves so a combination of factors has led to the role of the editor being diminished and also there is a sense now with proprietors that at the end of the day i am the owner this is my money who is this guy how dare he go around taking the credit for my publication that didn't happen in the old days so no, that's fascinating um in fact i wanted to just pick up the threads on that you spoke about access journalism in some ways and and that's facing a, a a challenge of its own now with the government and mr modi not willing to engage at all uh with journalists um but at the same time there is room i'm guessing for accountability journalism as well uh so this whole um if one were to look at access journalism and accountability journalism as two ends of the pole um if at all if that's what you believe uh, uh, one should look at it i just wanted to understand how you see that balance kind of shifting if at all okay first of all i always have problems with the term because all journalism is access you don't have access not just to politics but the sources on the ground to people who are involved in a story you don't have a story so you have to have access to be able to talk to people to find out what's happening and to be able to write about it so the suggestion that access journalism is some horrible elite preoccupation i find misplaced and people use i'm not you're not using it that way but a lot of people do accountability journalism i also find another misplaced term because if a government screws up everybody writes about how they screwed up there is no need to give it a grandiose term or to posit that access journalism and accountability journalism are two different things journalists have to meet people at all levels journalists have to hold governments to account that's something that's been taken for granted for many many years before these terms were invented on mr modi not giving access yes you are right but i just want to make the point that mr modi is not alone in this how many interviews has rahul gandhi given how many journalists has Radhi, rahul gandhi meet on an informal basis does priyanka gandhi meet how many people is in the media has sanya gandhi met over the last 2 or 3 years how many interviews has mamata banerjee given how many journalists has she met to explain herself we now live in an age where politicians have decided that the only journalists they'll talk to are tame journalists who will carry their vision version of what happened without to use your term demanding any kind of accountability so journalists have a problem in that people will not talk to us yeah that's a fair point um i have one last question and then i'll i i think there are some question people who want to ask questions uh we you work Uh, across three um, important cities uh, bombay calcutta delhi um, and i'm guessing that's kind of shaped your outlook in towards life and work 
in pretty significant ways. Um, would you kind of like to kind of talk a little about your experiences working across these cities and the culture there and uh, what you found and, and learned along the way? Yeah. Some lessons? Yeah, sure. I am from Bombay. I'm not terribly objective about my home city, but looking at it now, I find Bombay of the three cities is actually the most superficial that people really don't understand what's going on. And there's a lot of bullshitting. Well, the only thing people in Bombay understand is maybe business to some extent and films. The rest of it, the conversations you have in Bombay are usually bullshit. I like Calcutta because it's so divorced from the rest of India. Bengal lives in its own world. It's been ruled since 1977 by a succession of regional parties. The CPM pretended to be a national party, but it was basically a Bengali regional party. It's always been a sort of Republic of Bengal, and now with Mamadadi, it's much more a Republic of Bengal. And it's important, I think, to understand that. It's also, I think, equidistant from Delhi and from Bombay. So it's a good place to see both cities in perspective. Delhi is a bit obsessed with power. It's a bit obsessed with politics. But I think that's changed over the last 15 or 20 years. We used to caricature Delhi as a company town, and the company was the government of India. But Delhi's grown. There's much more money in Delhi now. People do different things. So it's much less obsessed with politics than it used to be. It is still also of the major cities of India, the loveliest, despite all the damage that's been done to it in recent years and the pollution. So in terms of quality of life, Delhi, I think, has the best quality of life. Bombay with each year becomes more and more slummy, which is very unfortunate. Calcutta still offers middle-class people like ourselves probably the best quality of life in terms of money in that it's not so difficult to live well in Calcutta. So I guess all three cities have their strong points. But if you were, if you had a choice, where would you prefer to be? Delhi, I'm guessing, or? I, I do. Okay. Thanks. I think uh, we lost you for, a, yeah, Charles. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, we, I, I want to just come back, uh, uh, Kumar, I'll just uh, come in for a moment. Uh, uh, we, I uh, just wanted to come back to you uh, on some of the other observations that you have uh, made uh, in your book. And I just want to, um, uh, you know, uh, there is this assessment you have made about Narasimha Rao. Uh, and uh, I thought uh, they were uh, rather brutal. Uh, you called him... Uh, quote unquote, a small time manipulator um, mm. on the one hand. Um, mm. And then on the one hand, there is another school of thought led by academics such as uh, Vinay Sitapati, for instance. Um, to research, uh, to believe that Charles, previous... Charles Probably... come closer to the Yasan. Yeah, you're again too far away from him. Yeah. Yeah. Is that better? Try say something and we'll tell you. Yeah, I'm so sorry about that. No, I was saying that, you know, um, that, you know, there was, uh, on the one hand, you know, you have articulated your reasons why you thought of him as a, of Narasimha Rao as a small time manipulator and mm. a very insecure kind of a person. Mm. And then on the other hand, there's another school of thought led by people such as Vina Sitapati, uh, whose book and research, uh, uh, has argued that he was the his was the unseen face and voice of reforms, and uh, without unseen him, face and was, voice of what? Sorry, uh, of reforms. Yes, no way. I thought he was a very seen voice. It wasn't exactly a secret. No? Uh, that he was the one who actually uh, plumped for Manmohan Singh for uh, finance minister and offered cover to him over everyone else and changed India's equation. Uh, with the rest of the world. Uh, yes, that's my view too. That's what I say in the book. He actually offered the job first to I.G. Patel because he needed a reformer. And when I.G. turned it down, Manmohan Singh was his second choice. I also say in the book that Manmohan Singh, who often resigned and sulked and wept when he was attacked, was forced to stay on and persuaded to stay on by Narasimha Rao, who provided political cover to him, and that the reforms would not have happened without Narasimha Rao. Oh. No disagreement. So, uh, so that's where the dichotomy kind of scared. That's where I, I, you know, there was a, there was a dichotomy in my mind, you know, because you kind of 
also called him a small time manipulator at some point in time you know and mm. that is where i could not reconcile that i caught it in my mind. I, i i don't think we need to make that mistake i mean people often are put into situations that are challenging and rise to the occasion i think narasimha rao is the classic example of that he is this is a man who when the night the 1991 election was held refused to contest saying he was too old he had packed up all his belongings was ready to go and retire in andhra pradesh yet when he was made prime minister as a compromise candidate narasimha rao who had never before in his life shown the slightest interest in economics and had never before shown any interest in the reforms process realized what needed to be done he realized that india was bankrupt that the imf would not bail us out unless the reforms were to be implemented and he did that he did that took him about what about 2 years or so after which he lost interest in the reforms process and there were no further reforms but those 2 years i think were important in the history of india and there is no getting away from narasimha rao's credit and for what he achieved in those 2 years but for a man who died at the age of 80 something you cannot judge his whole life on the basis of those 2 years you have to judge it throughout his career and throughout his career he never achieved anything terribly significant he was essentially a small time manipulator right so having said that another uh, assertion that you have made uh, that also stood out uh, for me uh, is that uh, you describe prime minister manmohan singh as the most brilliant uh, man since jawaharlal nehru to become the prime minister of india and uh, uh, now that is a pretty very strong assertion uh, to make uh, for all his frailties as well uh, uh, that you just articulated okay. tell me uh, one or tell me one prime minister from jawaharlal nehru to manmohan singh who was as brilliant no i i do not dispute his brilliance at all i do yeah. not i do not dispute his brilliance uh but uh, you have also uh, described in much detail how uh, fidgety he could get about even the you know about criticism for instance about his lack of political about the about his political base um Uh, about uh, his second term being a washout how it uh, you know uh, you, uh, your assessment of his second term was not very flattering at all so how do you kind of compare uh, that you know uh, and you'll have to pardon my ignorance on this one compare what uh, uh, you know my ignorance of no, no. Uh, how do you compare and you left that in unfinished compare what uh, the uh, uh, jawaharlal nehru uh is uh, considered you know he comes from a background where you know he fought for the freedom and you know bought india from the boom box that is oh, i see yeah. no, i i don't compare jawaharlal nehru and manmohan singh at all jawaharlal nehru was a towering figure who pr- brought this country helped bring this country freedom and created the india we know or at least the one we know at the moment uh so there is no prime minister in indian history who has come close or i think will come close to jawaharlal nehru in terms of what stature or in terms of what he did for india my sole point about manmohan singh was that academically intellectually he was an outstanding person and that most politicians are not with the exception of jawaharlal nehru so that was the only parallel i was making i was not suggesting in any way that manmohan singh was the equal of jawaharlal nehru got it got it got it uh kumar uh, would you like to introduce yourself and uh, ask ask your question to me please yeah hi uh, thank you so much it's all, it's uh, so enriching and and insightful listening to you veer uh, you've been an incredible uh, um, writer editor um, and i'm i'm a deputy editor i'm with the indian express group actually uh, my uh, question is actually these days increasingly with the digital footprint expanding uh, people have got into the habit of typecasting journalists very quickly just two stories and you're typecast as you know 
say for example very easy for someone to say okay we we is you know uh, anti narsimara or pro uh, sonia gandhi you know but you have a stature where you you don't you can't be easily typecast but think of a young journalist today he does the does the has the moral clarity doesn't suffer from in trying to uh, dish out an illusion of fairness in his story but then he, he gives an all sided story a factual let the weight of truth prevail but then the the subject he is speaking to is today able to self broadcast as ha- is able to manipulate his competitor um, um, uh, publications and gets a group think against what is actually correct so as for a young journalist who starting out uh, this is a huge problem that they will have to contend with and you know quickly get typecast and also uh, how do you see the you know uh, emerging challenges for journalists and what's your advice to them as a as a veteran actually come on it's even worse than you describe because it isn't competing journalists or competing publications that they will get to typecast a journalist politicians now have at their disposal squadrons of social media people often when journalists do a fair story or a true story they then end up being trolled being abused on social media and this can i think for young journalists particularly young journalists who attempt to tell the truth or do a honest job be an incredibly dispiriting thing here you've done a story you've spoken to everyone you've done what you consider as a fair story and then the trolls go after you they call you names they say you were paid off by so and so etc i've seen this happen i mean you're saying that i was pro sonia gandhi or whatever but these days i'm now i'm not saying it i'm not i'm i'm i'm, no, I'm far from me, this no i understand no i understand what you're saying but i am a favorite target of congress trolls who attack me these days viciously saying that i am a secret modi supporter that i want to create a hindu india etc now i am old enough to see through all this nonsense and i've been it but if i had been younger if i had started out would i have been that mature i think i would have been really disturbed by it and the level of hatred you see on social media is really frightening and it's not always easy to understand that there is a motive behind it that this is not real criticism it's being done to demoralize you or to discredit you so yeah the job of young journalists now is much more difficult than it was in our time and unfortunately there is no shortage of journalists who are willing to pass judgment on other journalists and attack them as well which is something i am very reluctant to do because who am i to pass judgment on other people so i think the only thing you can tell people is that if you're going to come into this profession realize that no matter how good a job you do there are sharks out there and the sharks will go for you if they sense that there's blood in the water so be brave be careful there's not much else you can do thanks thanks that is it is yeah encouraging but thanks so much for this really admire whatever you write and and say thanks thank so you. much thanks kumar thank you kumar uh, so we uh, prince kumar uh, raised the point of sharks in the water one episode uh, that you have discussed at length and uh, which stayed in the minds of a lot many of us it was uh, the mira radia affair and uh, as a business writer then uh, i was also among those who was watching that affair and uh, i also had uh, was among those who had to go through her company uh, to access the tata group and uh, when those recordings stumbled out into the public domain it took a long time to wrap my head around that and many of us were stumped by what is going on now you have explained their position in the book and that the and that the tapes were doctored and it's uh, and 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 you and where you stand and what really happened uh, but the but the affair stayed in the minds of many people for a very long long while now what i am curious to ask you is what did that do to you how how much did that impact you did that did that mentally emotionally did that alter you in in which way it did it it it, 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 it it did charles it did in the short term i mean that's one of the reasons i gave that answer to kumar i think initially the media because everybody europe is a journalist you must know that copies of these tapes 
audio files along with transcripts of about I think 50 or maybe less of those conversations and there were several thousand conversations so somebody had obviously picked 50 were delivered to various newspaper offices in a brown paper envelope so initially i think media and media outlets were a little responsible they treated it with a certain amount of caution nobody knew whether these tapes were accurate where they'd come from whether the transcripts themselves were accurate but what then happened was there was this huge surge in social media I remember getting up in the morning and seeing, and Twitter was relatively new and relatively gentle then. And I'd been on Twitter for a couple of years, and the only other people on Twitter were decent people who wanted a few things. And there was this abuse directed me day in and day out at Barkhadat and with other people who had been on those tapes, mainly journalists. Nobody attacked the politicians or the others who were on it. And it was an incredibly dispiriting experience. And you said to yourself, do people really hate me? Do they really believe this? Do they really believe we're all so bad? And I know Barkha had the same feeling. And as the social media campaign went on, and it was what, hundreds of tweets an hour, more or less, newspapers were being accused, particularly on Twitter, of keeping a conspiracy of silence going. They started covering the story, and the social media campaign achieved what it set out to achieve. Now, this was an innocent error. None of us had heard of the IT cell. We hadn't heard of bots. We hadn't heard of sock puppets. We hadn't heard of troll farms. We believed that these were real people. I went back two, three years later and tried to trace. Many of those accounts had disappeared. Some of them had four followers. Some of them had five followers. Many of them, in those days, it was much easier to do a fake account on Twitter. Now that it's difficult now. It was clearly an operation engineered by some people to draw attention to these tapes, and in the case of both Barkha and myself, to question our liberal credentials and to paint us as being tools of the government. In fact, one of the charges, which was not even on the tape, nothing on the tape substantiated that, was that we had offered cabinet berths to people. This was repeated so often on social media that people began to believe that the tapes said this. The tapes said no, nothing on the tape suggested that. So yeah, it did. It did upset me. It did hurt me. And what hurt me, I think, more was Vinod Mehta had been this very close friend of mine from the Bombay days. And he ran the tapes. He was actually the first major publication to run the tapes. And he not only ran the tapes, he wrote on the cover the 2G tapes, the picture of M.K. Venu, who's a journalist, who's founder of The Wire, myself, Barkha, Ratan Tata, etc., and I think I was appalled because I have never met Raja in my life to this day. Never even spoken to him on the phone. I didn't cover telecom. I had no clue what was happening with the 2G scam. And the 2G scam had taken place long before these tapes were even recorded. So I went and saw Vinod and I said, these tapes are doctored, I can tell you that. He said, yeah, I've never said that they're genuine. I have said we cannot vouch for the authenticity of the tapes. So I said, you're going to run this allegation against me, Sam, I'm part of the 2G scam on the cover. Don't you think you have a responsibility to contact me before and ask for my response? So surely a basic rule of journalism. And he said, ha, huh, but then, you know, we would have lost impact. Basically, what it boiled down to, as we talked about Outlook at the moment, was that Outlook circulation was on the skids. They were in a bad way. They needed some scoop or the other to get into the public consciousness again. He'd, had, he'd sat on the tapes for a while, he said. They'd been given to a member of his staff. And ultimately, as they started going public, his staff started telling him, you have let the story go just because your friends are on it or whatever. So he felt under massive pressure to carry the tapes. After that, after the tapes appeared and the CBI told the Supreme Court, I think on three separate occasions, that the tapes had been doctored. I had the tapes tested at various labs in the US and the UK. I went back to Vinod and I said, now it's quite clear the tapes have been doctored. Do you want to have a look at it again? He said, no, you can write a piece, so which I did. I did write a piece carrying the reports of the tapes or whatever. But he refused to retract his story. Then Venu sued them. And then they ran a little thing on the letters page saying they regretted what they'd said about Venu. So I said, I will sue you. Why don't you just run this for me? And he refused. And then, as you know, 
we know this kicked upstairs and somebody else was made editor but the management of outlook this point blank refused to even admit there was any doubt about the tapes and even assuming for the purpose of argument that the tapes were authentic they certainly did not suggest i had lobbied for raja or was part of the 2g scam they refused to even say that i had to go to court they hoped i think that because they were a large co- uh, corporation funded by rich sindhis and i was a guy on my own i would run out of money but i kept at it and it took several years and ultimately when the judge told them just settle you don't have a hope in hell they did run the small correction so it just irritated me that it was so hard in a way to get justice or to get even the truth on record even from your friends that must have been a awful awful experience because i would yeah, imagine well, that we know meta uh, who is an editor who all of us in the business revere and he was a very close friend of yours and yeah. uh, he would have given you the benefit of doubt to this i, I just think that's a no, no, I mean, by this stage you know by this stage you were be- beyond the benefit of doubt you had tests of the tapes you had the cbi saying to the supreme court that there were problems i mean it, it wasn't really nobody was saying the tapes had been undoctored it was he just refused to do it because he had said in his autobiography in which to be fair to me he said very nice things about me that this was the biggest political story of the decade or something so and he said in another interview that if you cut my heart open you will find rabia tapes written in them which is a terrible thing to say about your own heart but he did say it and so it was really a big deal for him it made him feel he was important he was relevant he'd broken a story and he was damned if he was going to deny it no matter what the truth was right got you got you for those of you who've logged in late we're in conversation with veer swangwe so if you have questions please raise your hand or just punch them in the uh, box we've got a little more time to go before we call it a hard stop um and we're discussing his personal life and uh, his impressions on politics uh, around uh, india as he has seen it first hand and uh, i'm just uh, coming at you weir with the next question um we there is a very interesting insinuation you make about the end of ups tenure uh towards the end of ups tenure and that got my attention and like i told you uh, you know there are some really jaw dropping moments you know and i i just paused for a moment when i read that when you say that it was not narendra modi that finished them off but arvind kejriwal actually and that he may have had the covert backing of the rss cadre now on reading that i like i said you know i my jaw actually dropped and i said oh why would the rss do that and uh, why would kejriwal accept this support you know and uh, i thought i must ask you that i must uh, raise this with you know uh, what what was your what was your reading really because i was i was hoping to get some more out of the congress view is that the whole thing was an rss operation and kejriwal was a front man i have never actually bought this i believe that kejriwal who i knew slightly before all this started because we at the hindustan times partnered with him on a campaign for a right to information act i believe that he was on the make he was an opportunist he was looking for an opportunity to rise to prominence he decided on this india against corruption movement he approached other people to be the face because he was unknown of then and finally anna hazare who was also a publicity hound who we known from maharashtra jumped on the bandwagon and said he would become the head of this movement or at least the face of this movement and he was foolish enough to believe that it was genuinely his movement whereas everybody has recognized i think at that stage it was kejriwal who was calling the shots at that stage i think kejriwal was willing to tell, take help from anybody the rss saw the potential for damaging the upa and not only sent crowds to make up his rally it also said when people forget this but sadvi ritambra was on the stage was a polling woman who said ek dhakka aur do was on the stage along with them many rss type people hung around Kiran Bedi, we know famously, then actually went ahead and joined the BJP. I've spoken to people who were involved, like Yogendra Yadav, who was part of it, who has said in so many words that there was an R S strong R S S component. Prashant Bhushan has said not to me, but in the media that there was a strong R S S component. This is not to say that 
Kejriwal was the puppet of the RSS, only that when the RSS saw that this agitation was happening, they decided if they provided the numbers, because Kejriwal had no mass support, and they beefed it up, and they got their supporters on social media and in the media, it's a mainstream media, to hype it. There was huge potential for damage. And yes, there was, because the UPA mishandled the whole thing, and the image assisted by the then controller and our comptroller and auditor general Vinod Rai, that the UPA was a government of scams, was firmly entrenched in people, imprinted in people's minds. So the RSS's role there was not in creating Kejriwal, but in keeping the movement going. Most interesting. Like I said, you know, while, while that was a moment where, you know, I actually paused, there were other moments, you know, where I actually laughed out loud, you know, uh, as well. Uh, and this had to do with your impressions and interactions about um, uh, where you have a very lighter moments about your about breakfast meetings uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, presidents from Pakistan. Uh, who have this uh, knack for calling breakfast meetings and about how awful you get at uh, early hours, you know. So I really laughed at that. But on a more serious note, uh, the whole thing around uh, the, uh, around Pakistan's consistent position around Kashmir. Um, uh, now, the a line that you have taken there bases all your um, conversations uh, with uh, heads of state from Pakistan, I was a little surprised uh, by that because I would have imagined that uh, you, uh, in my mind, um, the impression I carry is that of someone who is a liberal, uh, I use that word very deliberately, uh, liberal who would hold for peace, but you have argued that this um, that both countries have drifted too far apart. And um, uh, what is it that you fear most on the geopolitical front with Pakistan currently? Your, your, uh, the impression I got is that the mainstream narrative, the English mainstream narrative, is, is, is downright psychophancy and it plays into Pakistan's spin machine. Yeah, I believe, for better or worse, I mean, I am a liberal, and I'm glad you chose that word deliberately, but I am not a peacenik. I have nothing but, contempt is too strong a word, but amusement for people who go and light candles on the Wagha border. I think you have to be realistic that until recently, Pakistan had no real reason to exist, especially after Bangladesh went away. You had to ask yourself, if you were a Pakistani, why did we need a separate country? Islam was not enough to unite the two of us. What, what is the reason for Pakistan's existence? The answer has been provided to the Pakistani people consistently by the army in the hope of maintaining its preeminent position in Pakistani society, which is that India cannot bear the idea of Pakistan existing, and we live, therefore, under the threat of invasion or being swallowed up or destroyed by India. This argument has allowed the Pakistani army to grab a huge, huge share of Pakistan resources. As a proportion of GDP, Pakistan spends much more on its army than India or any other place in this region. The Pakistani army, therefore, has no real interest in making peace with India. You will have the odd overture, but essentially it's always one step forward, two steps back. Ever since I can remember, we've been having peace talks and negotiations. And ever since I can remember, nothing has changed. I think you have to live with the fact that the Pakistanis have never forgiven us for Bangladesh. That they've forgotten that they tried to do the same thing with the Nagas and the Bezos, who they armed in the hope of fermenting trouble against India. The policy of the Pakistani state is to create trouble for India. If you want to make friends with Pakistan, and I would be very happy to be friends, because it's much better to be friends than spend money on military exercises and on arms and ammunition. You have to go in there with your eyes open. You have to realize why they have a vested interest in keeping hostility with India going. If you go in over there and do this jappi papi nonsense, light candles on the Wagha border and say, we are all the same people, you're setting yourself up for a fall. 
So as you can tell, I have no peacemaker. You are not a peacemaker. So while on that, while on that, the kind of uh, the kind of uh, tone that uh, the current Prime Minister Modi has adopted, where would you reckon? How would you how would you reckon his stance vis-à-vis Pakistan is? It's not clear to me what tone he has adopted because he rushed off to feed cake to Nawaz Sharif on his birthday. The government blows <laughs> hot for Pakistan. I'm not sure there is a consistent Pakistan policy. Uh, you have spoken about the rise of Modi and the BJP in 2014. Now, that was a very, very interesting uh, 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 rise that you charted out, and you touched upon it briefly. I wanted to come to that. Uh, there is a correlation you pointed to, to the rise of Modi and the adoption of social media on the one hand. Uh, you spoke about the denial of the Congress to even acknowledge how this change is happening, and you pointed out, you pointed this out to senior leaders in the Congress. Was this, was what, what was going on? Did the Congress just refuse to see this coming? You touched upon this briefly. What is it about Modi that he saw this coming? How could he use this to his advantage, to his advantage? And how couldn't Rahul Gandhi, whom you point out as someone who is bright, not see this coming? And you know, if I may venture out and ask, does he even have a future left anymore? Yeah, you know, I don't know Rahul Gandhi well, but the times I have met him, I have always liked him. I have been struck not only by his decency, but by the fact that he's incredibly well read. He is very well informed. He has a good idea of what happens in the world outside. Where I think he is lacking, and this is not something you can tell by meeting him, but something you can tell by observing him, is that he doesn't appear to have the political instincts of his mother. Sonia Gandhi, who was an outsider to politics, tried to keep her husband from joining politics, did not want to join politics. But once she did get into it, after a few years of adjustment, she ended up having very shrewd political instincts. It's not a conscious thing or an intelligence thing. Either you have an instinct or you don't. So far, I have seen, and so far it's pretty long now, I have seen no evidence that Rahul has any instinct. He makes the wrong decisions, which sound rational. I'll give you an example, but are not. Okay, let's take that famous Ornob interview. That interview, I've mentioned this in the book, was actually promised to Barkhadat. It was then with NDTV. It was going to be his first interview. A date was fixed. And then they called her and they cancelled it and they said, we want to postpone it because Rahulji is travelling or we'll do it at some other one. Then they put, if I can remember correctly, a series of absurd conditions. You shoot it at the RGF. Our own cameraman will shoot it. We will give you the tapes. And just what went on in this ridiculous fashion. While all this was going on, Ornob went and met Rahul. And he showed him statistics that showed that Times Now did better than NDTV, which is true. Times Now did do better than NDTV. It still does. Rahul then went back on his promise to give the interview to NDTV. And he argued that you have to make a rational and logical decision. How do we choose a journalist? Well, we've chosen Times Now, not because I like it or anything, but an objective criteria. It has higher viewership. And so he went ahead and gave that interview to Arno. There was nobody around there to tell him, have you watched Arno's show? Have you heard what he says about you, what he says about the Congress? Are you aware that if it's the first interview you're giving, you will get the highest ratings no matter which channel you're on? It doesn't matter which is the number one channel or the number two channel. There was just nobody in the Congress system who would tell him that. He went into that interview thinking he'd made a logical, rational decision and essentially crash-landed his career right after takeoff. That's the classic example of a Rahul decision. It seems logical, it's rational, it's backed by statistics, but it's disastrous. So therefore, politics is not necessarily about intelligence. Often it's about common sense. Often it's about instincts. And so far, what I've seen of Rahul, it does not suggest to me that he has the same instincts as his mother. 
That's interesting. Uh, we're, I know I am extremely cognizant of the time as well, but I am going to ask you two more questions before I, and if others don't have questions to go, I will. Uh, I've got to go, there. Charles. So we'll, yes, but you can do two more, it's not a problem. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, very, very straight up. Uh, uh, we're, just how do you manage to get away with asking people the kind of things to you, that you do, you know? How do you get away by asking SRK, Shah Rukh Khan about his sexuality, for instance, or for that matter, you know, pushing the Dalai Lama about his views on sex, or, you know, you messed around with uh, Mother Teresa, you lied to her, uh, you know, about uh, to get that interview, you know, about, uh, about it being on Time magazine. I mean, seriously, what does that tell you about people? About Shah Rukh Khan, everybody in the film industry and the film press would say off the record that he is gay. Nobody would have the guts to say it to his face. I'd never met Shah Rukh Khan. He was very kind to come for an interview pretty much on the spot. We hadn't fixed it in advance. It seemed like a perfectly natural question to ask him. And he answered it, I thought, very well. He said, no, he wasn't gay. And we asked him in the context, I asked him in the context of why there were no rumors about him having affairs. Was it, I said, because he was actually gay. And he explained that, no, he wasn't. Nobody thought anything of that. At least I didn't think anything of that. I don't think he did because we were very friendly. We went on with the interview. He left on good terms. But after the interview was telecast, the film press, which had gone on and on with little nudge nudge, wink wink suggestions about Shah Rukh and Karan Johar, etc., went berserk because here somebody had actually asked him what they had been suggesting all along. And I thought Shah Rukh was really classy about the whole thing even though people kept saying, how could you let him ask you, etc. I remember a journalist from Film Magazine asked him, why did Veer Sangvi ask if you were gay? And Shah Rukh replied, I have no idea. Maybe if I had said yes, he would have asked me out to dinner after the interview, which I thought was really classy <laughs> and good reply. And I admired him for that. Yeah. And the Dalai Lama, I actually always, I actually tried to be over clever. I asked him about homosexuality. Now you're going to think I'm a homophobe or something. Oh, Only because Richard Gere and so many of his followers and friends in Los Angeles were people who said all kinds of sex was okay, objected to prejudice. And here was the Dalai Lama. And I knew that Buddhist monks on the whole had pretty conservative social views. And I wanted to challenge him and to find out whether his own views were in line with those of his Californian supporters. And to his credit, they were. He said that he had a completely open mind on whether how people had sex, who they had sex with, as long as it was done with understanding and compassion. Who could say any more than that? So in answer to your question, I find often that there are things people talk about and do a nudge nudge, wink wink sort of thing. It's always better when you interview people to ask them about them. And if you ask nicely, most people don't mind. <laughs> and... Uh... We, uh, one last question for me, you know, you start, you started your book by saying that you were never school captain, but mm -hmm. always a monitor and a pattern that has probably recurred throughout my life. Now, mm -hmm. as I close the last page, I didn't get it. What did I miss here? I'm really envious about the kind of life you've lived until now and that you got away saying all the things that you did, doing all the things that you did. And uh, honestly, I would have really enjoyed to be as rude as you have. Okay. No, what I meant, Charles, what I meant, Charles, was there are many people who are very competitive, who are determined to be number one at everything, who see every other journalist as competition or every other television anchor as competition. I have never been like that. I have never been driven to be number one. Yes, I'm driven to do what I do well. I'm driven to be successful. But never in terms of <clears throat> being number one, being the best. So being a monitor for me is more than enough. Being school captain, I'll leave to the people who are really ambitious. Great. Veer, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for taking as much time out. Your book was lovely to read. And to those of you who have logged in, please, if you haven't read it, I, I most certainly recommend this. It's one heck of a read. Uh, like I've shared earlier. We thank you so much once again. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thank for, you. I hope you didn't get too bored, but thank you for giving me the opportunity. Thanks a ton.
Thank you, Veer. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.